my question on the list was, uh, what trends are you seeing? I'm really interested in, you know, what you're seeing, you're kind of right at the nexus of stuff that's going on. So I'd be interested here, like for XAPI, mm. you know, general interest, LRS design, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I think with XAPI in particular, we noticed a, quite a significant change at the end of 2016, where before that point, a lot of the projects that we were seeing were pilots and experiments and people just wanting to test out XAPI. Um, and really from the end of the summer 2016 onwards, we started to see a lot more projects that were real enterprise implementation of XAPI. Um, and as a result of that, obviously it takes a little while to go from someone kicking off a project to actually implementing it and seeing the benefit of that project um, to being ready to publish a case study. And so by April 2018, which is actually five years since um, XAPI was version 1.0.0 was originally published, um, we ran a series of webinars, which we called Zappy's April, to celebrate that end of the five years. And because of that shift that we saw in 2016, we, we had um, five completely new case studies that we were able to talk about with organizations actually implementing XAPI and seeing the benefit of it. So we're, we're kind of just now starting to see those case studies come out um, and having lots and lots of case studies where people can see real organizations are doing real things with XAPI, um, which I think is, is what's necessary for XAPI to be adopted um, kind of more ubiquitously as a SCORM has been. Um, and you're, and you're saying, when you say case studies, you mean published case studies on, on like, um, like the Visa one on the website? Yeah, exactly. Visa was probably one of the early ones that, that sort of bucks that trend. Visa were, were, were really early. Um, but then we've got a bunch more new ones that we published. Uh, so there were five. Let's see if I can remember all five. Uh, so PwC was one, Caterpillar was one, Bear Paint was one. Um, what were the others? Uh, Quicken Loans was one, and uh, there was one other one. Um, so yeah, the, these published case studies of, of what people are doing. So originally in April, they were webinars, and you can get the webinar recordings, and we're slowly working through those webinars and converting them into written case studies, um, just to make them a little bit more accessible if, if people have less time than to watch whole mm -hmm. How, how are these people um, finding out about XAPI? I mean, are they coming to you like, oh, I already know a lot about this. Um, I'm really interested or, well, I, I, I've been hearing about this. I don't know anything about it. Or, or, I mean, how are they even hearing about it? Yeah, I mean, I think by the time they come to us, or at least by the time they speak to us, they will have some familiarity with XAPI. We have a lot of resources on our website. so. Even if they don't know about it when they come to our website, they'll, they'll know about it by the time they leave. Um, so how are they hearing about XAPI? I, I think, you know, conferences, there's lots of talk about XAPI, loan development conferences, um, magazines, um, maybe Twitter. Um, it, it's hard to say. I think a lot of our leads, either they you know come to us directly it's hard to know exactly where they originally got the idea um or they maybe met us at a conference and spoke to us um and we do have cases sometimes where somebody would do something with xapr at one organization uh, and then they'll move to another organization and then sort of come back to us at their, their new organization um and look to do things with xapr as well uh-huh um, yeah, in terms of interest in learning analytics, you, you asked about that as well. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's again, it's a, bit, a bit more of a mindset change where um, organizations are starting to think more about learning analytics. We did a survey a little while ago. Uh, we've, we've run it two years in a row asking people about you know, what's stopping them getting started with learning analytics. And we are seeing more people saying that they're feeling uh, executive pressure to do things with learning analytics. So um, the, kind of the organization is asking for data about learning. Um, it's, it's actually 10. It's actually 10. Oh, looks like someone just joined. 
Hello. Hello. Uh, this is um, we. I missed up the time, so I'm going to mute myself. Hi. No um. Yes, just continuing that that answer. So, um, I think there is starting to be a shift where you know a lot of learning development departments might be used to just churning out content, churning out courses on demand from the business, and they're starting to recognise that they need to have a slightly more strategic role um, and, and really think about how their training is, is actually impacting the business. And those kind of shifts make learning analytics more important because you need the data. Um, in terms of LRS design, I don't know if there are really trends there, like an LRS as, a, as defined by its API, that is a very specific product. Um, and there are free products that exist that, that meet all the basic requirements of XAPI. Uh, for example, we have Watershed Essentials, which is a free account. It does all the XAPI basics but then products are differentiating themselves by what they do with the data. And so, um, you know, products like Watershed and, and, and others are, have learning analytics reporting and that sort of thing built on top. Um, I think we're also starting to see some demand for people wanting to use the data for things like automation. Um, so maybe triggering delivery of training content or something like that based off of XAPI data rather than just presenting that data in reports. And that's where we're just starting to move into. Great, okay, um, uh, on to the next. Uh, how can people use XAPI more effectively, either in terms of the implementation or the data and results? Yeah, I think it's um, a key thing, I think, is having the right mindset. So I sometimes use the analogy of XAPI is a little bit like USB, um, USB being the this, this standard way of connecting devices together, connecting things to your computer. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily think about how can you use USB more effectively. It's more about how, how can you use the things that rely on USB. So don't think, how can I do an XAPI project, but rather think, uh, how can I use data to improve the learning that I'm providing, the, the resources and training. Um, and that, the answer to that will probably be to use XAPI, or at least part of the answer. Um, but it's not about just thinking about XAPI because if, if you just think I want to use XAPI, it can be quite hard to pin down exactly what you're going to do with XAPI and it becomes more of a solution looking for a problem, um, which is, is less helpful. Um, so yeah, look for, think, think about the whole strategy and use XAPI as part of the technology rather than just thinking about the technology. Yeah, I, I like that analogy with USB. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, um, so next question: How is it being used, um, and you know, how can it be, how can it be used to support new pedagogies, learning technologies, delivery methods, etc.? Yeah. So especially things like informal learning, um, where if you've got a scenario where the learner is able to find their own learning and the role of the learning development department or the various teams involved is to provide content to that learner that, that they're looking for, whether that's curating content or cur curate, uh, sorry, creating or curating content, um, then it's really important to know what is it that the learners are looking for. Because if you, if you don't know what they're interested in, you don't know what content to put in front of them. Um, and so for a lot of our clients, one of the most important reports, if not the most important, is one looking at search results to see what are people actually looking for. Um, and then you can compare what people are looking for with what's actually provided and, and fill that gap. And one of our clients told me a story where um, they were training one of their new territories. And even in that training session, they looked at that search terms report and they were able to identify a particular topic that everybody was searching for, but which they had very little content for and then they were able to very quickly address that. So that kind of report can, can give you some really quick wins in terms of making sure you've got content covering what people are searching for at a given point in time, because it will change over time. And, and so you need that ongoing data to, to keep an eye on that and make sure you've always got data covering what people are looking for. Was there something in particular that um, led them to using XAPI to track 
the searches other than just, you know, plain vanilla um, search, you know, logs or whatever? Yeah, so the, the main advantage of uh, XAPI over something like maybe Google Analytics or something like that, that um, it's just giving you the basic data is it's identifying the person. Um, so for that particular report, just looking at search terms, maybe you don't need to know who it is that's searching. Um, but then maybe you want to kind of dig a little bit more deeply and you want to look at um, which departments in our organization are searching for different things. And in that case, you need to know who's doing the searching so you can map the searches to the different departments. Or maybe you want to do something even more complex where you want to look at you know, following the journey of an individual learner through searching for something, through to then actually finding something, accessing the e-learning, completing that, maybe getting a particular score. Um, so you might want to look at the data right across that. You need to have the identifier for the person. Um, and that's what XAPI does particularly well. Um, I think actually though, in, in both the cases uh, that I'm thinking of where we have clients doing that, um, they are, you know, they, they've really bought into the vision of XAPI in general. So XAPI is their default way of collecting data about learner interactions. So they wouldn't even necessarily be asking the question about, you know, which data format should we be using because they're using XAPI to get everything so that they can get that complete overview. Right. So once they start using XAPI for, for something, um, that's kind of their, their default for other things. That makes sense. I think so, yeah. And, and the advantage of that, of course, is that you can then compare the data from different things and look at it in the same format. You don't want to have the data all in lots of different buckets. and lots Right, of right. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, on to uh, some questions specific to your watershed work. Um, um, what are most of your clients, can you generalize about your clients? What are they using XAPI and learning analytics for? Are, are they, so there, to me there's sort of these categories of um, decision making, research, student assessment. Maybe there's others I can't think of right now, but those seem to be the, the broadest categories. Yeah, I came up with um, sort of four different categories that I would kind of group our clients into. Really, I came up with three categories, but then there was one of our clients that didn't fit into either of them. So I have the fourth category. Um, so one of them is, you know, just they want to know if people have done the stuff they're supposed to have done. So this, this particular group of people is enrolled on these courses, whether that's e-learning, whether that's face-to-face -face training, whatever it is. Um, have they done those things that they're enrolled on? Are they actually doing the things that they're supposed to do? Uh, and that obviously fits in with the compliance use case. Um, but there are also other areas where you want people to do a certain set of things. Um, and so that they're kind of tracking what were people supposed to do? What have they actually done? And, and then comparing those, those two things. Um, another use case is that they want to see uh, utilization of different platforms, different resources, different modalities. So maybe they want to know, you know what are the most popular pieces of content? Um, what are people searching for the most? We already talked about. Um, are videos more popular than documents, PDF documents? Are e-learning courses more popular than training? You know, how much is this stuff being used? Who's using it? That, that can be an important one. When are people using things? Um, whether that's time of day or day of the week or, or perhaps over time, how usage is, is, is changing. Are people using more of content from one particular vendor um, versus another content vendor? But those kinds of utilization questions. Then the third category is looking at the impact of training on business KPIs. Um, this one we're seeing, I mean, we're seeing this across the industries. Um, but particularly in medical um, organizations that we work with, this seems to be a common one that, that they want to look at is, is actually the training having an impact on patient outcomes. Uh, and then we actually do have clients looking at this in terms of profitability as well in, in other industries. Um, but particularly medical, it, yeah, look, comparing people that did the training with people that didn't um, and, and how that's affecting outcomes. And then the fourth one, uh, which is actually um, really probably only applies to one of our clients at the moment, 
is actually using the data to inform personalized learning. So for example, the, this one client, they, um, they have coaching sessions for their managers, the managers are coached. And whenever they do those coaching sessions, they pull in data from knowledge assessments and they pull in data about business KPIs and they use that to actually inform the coaching sessions to identify uh, if the manager is struggling in a particular area, are they struggling because they've got a knowledge gap or are they struggling to actually apply that knowledge? And obviously the intervention you need in both those categories is, is different depending on um, what the need is. So that's uh, the kind of four categories I would say. Have you had anyone uh, using XAPI for an adaptive system as sort of like the learner, the dynamic learner profile? So the, the idea there would be that the, the learner has a different learning experience based on some XAPI data, is that right? Right, uh, uh, you know, like an uh, intelligent tutoring system. Yeah, um, you know, I don't think any of our clients are doing that yet. I know it's something that can be done, uh, like Zappy Apps, for example, is a product that does that. Um, and we've, we've certainly pitched it uh, at some, you know, uh, some prospects but I don't know we've actually got any clients doing that today. I don't, I don't does, does, that, does that, you know, make sense to you as a, a way to design a, a learner profile module for an adaptive system? Is that, do you think that's a good solution? Can you um, just explain a little bit more about what you mean by a learner profile module? Um, yeah, so, you know, when we think about learner profiles, um, often we think of the static thing that's got your, you know, past learning history and, you know, some demographics and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then it's making decisions about, you know, how to direct you through the learning path or broker content um, based on this static learner profile. But um, people are starting to think now about, you know, dynamic learner profiles that are being built on the fly. Um, and, you know, smart algorithms or um, choosing content in a more sort of micro sense. Gotcha. And, yeah, and, I think. you know, and so XAPI could be the source for the, all the information about what the learners, you know, did in the last minute and how they, how the system should adapt to them. Yeah, I, I think, you know, definitely. Um, thinking about Zappy apps, how they've implemented this, the, the way they work is you can configure an adaptive learning path within Zappy apps. And you know, those paths can adapt based on a whole number of different things. It might be an assessment within Zappy apps, but they can also adapt based on XAPI data. Um, so one example um, that Nick, who runs Zappy apps set up, which I thought was really interesting, um, was having Salesforce feed into a learning path. So when a particular salesperson um, opens up a new opportunity for a particular product, you could then um, give them a piece of training um, about that particular product. Uh, and obviously that could also bring in other data about you know, how well they've scored previously about that product or how recently they did training about that product to inform that decision. Um, but yeah, it's definitely possible and I think gonna be useful uh, if you're designing these adaptive learning paths to, to read in XAPI data, absolutely. Great. Um, so next question, have you ever had to do significant custom installations or configurations um, that are, you know, really different from, you know, out of the box watershed? And, and what were the customer needs that led to this? I'm sort of thinking of, you know, sort of outlier cases, um, rather than the real sort of bread and butter obvious things. Okay. Yeah, let, I'll give you maybe two separate answers to this. So in terms of have we had to do significant custom installations that are different from out of the box, the, the way that Watershed is designed is it, it's this flexible, configurable platform. And so there isn't really an idea of out of the box um, and there isn't really an idea of custom um, installations. Uh, Watershed is cloud-based, so all of our customers have access to the same code base, the same features. So if, if a customer needs a new feature, 
and we develop something, we'll always develop that feature in a way that's going to benefit other customers in a kind of general way. So there isn't really such a thing as out of the box or custom. Um, and maybe as a result of that, or, or just on the basis that everyone's different, we, we do see different customers using Watershed in different ways. Um, sometimes it's, you know, there's four use cases that I just outlined. If, if they're doing something different with Watershed, obviously how they use it is going to be different. Um, other times, you know, it's just how they want to see the data presented. So they might use different visualizations just based on kind of preference or what they're used to. Um, and other times it, it might just depend on who's going to be viewing the data and how much detail they require the data and, and, and those kinds of differences. Um, yeah, in, in terms of people doing sort of very different things though, probably that, that fourth one that I mentioned, the kind of using data to inform learning, that's one that, that kind of stands out as being fairly different from what other people are doing. Um, the, uh, yeah, most of the other ones we see at least a couple of Watershed clients doing similar things with the data. Um, I guess another one that stands out is, you know, some of our customers are pulling data out of Watershed to, uh, to actually inform the learning experience. So um, Bear Paint, for example, they deliver their training uh, mostly via videos. Uh, they also have PDFs, I think, as well, but mostly videos uh, on a mobile app. Um, and they have a list of the most popular videos so that at a given time of year, um, a learner can go in, they can see what are the videos that everyone else is looking at. Um, and that is hopefully a helpful list of, of videos um, for that, that particular learner to use. And that's powered by Watershed. They're pulling the data out of Watershed via API, the process data, um, and they're using that to directly power that, that list of top 10 videos. So that's, I guess, a little bit different as well. I, I'm curious about um, these cases where, um, you know, that you just described about people looking at, you know, what's the most popular video over the last period of time or um, the coaching, you know, the fourth category that you mentioned yeah. um, where somebody's in a coaching session and they, and they um, pull data out, um, I, I assume in a, um, in a chart of some kind. Um, w during the coaching, they're actually looking at, you know, what is this person um, deficient in and making decisions on the fly? Is that correct? That's right, yeah. So they, that particular client has two main charts they use for that data. Um, the first one is just a scatter chart. So that's like giving them uh, an x-axis. The, I think the x-axis is based on, I might get this the wrong way around, but one of the axes is based on um, the knowledge competency. So you know, they, they've done the, the, the assessment, they've built out these assessments in storyline. Um, how did they score on those assessments? Um, and it's just looking at how, you know, their knowledge. And then the other axis is looking at how their area of the business that they're responsible for managing, how well that's performing. Um, and they have uh, each of their performance metrics is linked to a knowledge metric so that they can compare the two. So they can see you know, people in the top right are people that have got the knowledge and they're actually doing well. People in the top left are doing quite well, even though they don't really understand how they're doing quite well. Uh, and so they need some help with the theory. People in the bottom right are people that have got the theory, but they're not actually applying it. And so maybe they just need a little bit of encouragement. Uh, and, and the clients actually found that they can, that bottom right group, they can very quickly see improvement in that group um, just by kind of prodding them and, and, and prodding their managers uh, to help them to apply what they've learned. Uh, and then obviously the bottom left group is the people that don't really know what they're doing and also aren't doing particularly well. Um, so that's the group that kind of needs help in both the theory and actually applying it. So, so this is a, a, a chart that's designed for this particular use for these um, coaches. Or is this a generic chart that they've been trained to interpret and, and use? So in Watershed, we have a number of chart types. Um, and one of our chart types is a scatter chart. And obviously, you can use a scatter chart with any, day, any two metrics you can compare on a scatter chart. Uh, and so this client has configured that scatter chart 
to look at those particular metrics that are relevant for them. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, uh, the coaches or whoever can look at that scatter chart and they can see the dots for the people in those kind of four categories and they can move their mouse over the dots and they get a little pop up and it says, okay, that's Joe Bloggs. And they say, right, okay, we need mm. to go and target Joe Bloggs. The one that they actually use when they're talking to Joe Bloggs, so they might say, right, let's go and do a coaching session with everyone in the bottom right. Um, then they, you know, in that coaching session, that they'd pull up another chart, which would actually be a spider diagram. And again, the spider diagram is a generic report. Various customers use the spider diagram for different things. Um, but in this, in this customer's case, they use the spider diagram to look at these knowledge and these performance metrics. Um, so they can see for a particular person on their pricing metric, for example, uh, they ha they're actually doing pretty well in terms of their business metric, but they don't have the knowledge. And then they might see, well, in, in another area, they've got the knowledge, but they're not performing in the business. And so they can target the coaching based on that. Uh, and, and the spider diagram will compare, it will end up with kind of three spiders on, on top of it. So you've got the benchmark, you've got the knowledge score, and you've got the actual business score. And they're all kind of overlaid so you can see what's above benchmark and what's below benchmark. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty powerful uh, way to do coaching, I can imagine. Yeah, because you're immediately identifying where, what the areas of weaknesses are. Um, right. And it's, and it's completely objective. Um, obviously, mm. you, can, you can talk about more subjective stuff as well in the coaching session, um, but it gives you that ob objective data. Do you have any customers that, are, that have used, um, um, you know, like, um, rubrics and rating scales and things like that and, you know, pumping XAPI data out of some sort of, you know, rating instrument, like uh, maybe on a, uh, like doing a field observation or something on an iPad. Uh, yes, yeah, so in, in the medical space, we have uh, a couple of clients that will do observations on iPads and will record data from that. Um, and yeah. So they're assessing, so, they're assessing performance, you know, live performance with some sort of rating scale and Yes. Tracked with XAPI. Yeah, a lot of that data will, you know, the, um, the assessment will happen before it comes to us. So we would just get, you know, on this particular competency, the person scored a four, uh, and Watershed doesn't necessarily know what, what the four is, um, mm -hmm. but the person doing the assessment obviously would know that when they're entering the data. So it's not that we would crunch the data through a rubric. Um, it's more the rubric would be applied before the data went into XAPI. So, um, next question. So, who are the primary champions? Um, I guess what I'm really getting at is, um, who are the most important people to be talking to, to, you know, get an XAPI or a learning analytics project going and um, sustaining it? Yeah, I think there are two types of people. Um, and you, you need to have at least one of them, and ideally you have both of them. Our most successful clients are the ones that have got both of these types of people. Um, so the first person is an enthusiastic project sponsor who's got the vision for implementing XAPI across the organization, uh, and they're you know, relatively high up in the organization so that they've got the power um, and, and perhaps the budget to, to do a, a project around XAPI. Um, but it's also really helpful to have somebody uh, kind of down the chain, I suppose, uh, a more technical person who can actually get their head around XAPI, can maybe write a little bit of code if necessary, um, and can do what's needed to actually make XAPI happen. Um, some of our clients only have one or the other, um, and that can work. But as I say, the, you know, particularly for the large organization projects, you really do need both someone with a vision and someone with the technical skills, and, and they're rarely the same person. Right. And uh, next question, um, do any of your clients ask you about Caliper and why they should use one or the other, or is there any, are, are, are people always like, I'm gonna use XAPI, or are they considering Caliper? What, what, what? Yeah, Caliper's actually never come up. Um, 
yeah, most of our clients or I think all our clients at the moment are you know businesses or government organizations uh, hospitals um, mm -hmm. health right. systems, that sort of thing um, and I think Caliper is only relevant in the academic context so it just hasn't come up we did you know when Caliper um, kind of first launched we had a conversation internally about it you know would we adopt Caliper um, and I think we would if, if there was a demand for it um, but it honestly has it, it's never ever come up at all um, mm -hmm. so it's not something that, that we're even really thinking about right and and what um, what profiles or vocabularies do your clients use are there some that are really heavily used yeah this is a really interesting question um, I hope my answer doesn't get me in trouble at all but um, so profiles, I, you know, I, I'm very much behind profiles. I think profiles are a brilliant idea. Um, but in practice, there are some challenges around using profiles. And I don't think as, as an industry, as a community, kind of figuring out that these things, I don't really think we've, we've quite figured out a practical way of using profiles just yet. Um, and, and, you know, also there aren't that many profiles out there. So I think, at, you know, as a result of that, um, I can't think of many or there's maybe a couple of projects maybe using the video profile, um, uh, the one on, on registry. Um, I think there's one implementing the other video profile, which kind of illustrates the problem a little bit, there's two video profiles. Um, but other than that, you know, profile use is it's limited. Most, most of our XAPI data in Watershed does not follow a particular profile. Um, I, I just thinking about this question before this call, I note down a, a few reasons I think for this. Um, one reason I think you know, so far profiles, they've always taken years to develop. But I'm not aware of any profile that has been developed in, in less than a year. Um, and you know, they involve lots of people. It's just, it just takes a lot of time and effort to develop a profile. And if you're implementing your X API within your organization, you really need to have something stood up within six months uh, and, and to be showing some progress. Otherwise, your project's gonna get shut down, really. Um, so there just isn't time for an organization implementing X API. There isn't time for them to develop a profile. So really the profiles need to already exist, which they just don't at the moment. Um, I think you know, another issue of profiles is some of the groups developing profiles haven't always been that great at looking at existing implementations or looking even looking at existing profiles. And so there is a little bit of duplication there or it, people that are already implementing XAPI in this area, um, suddenly a profile group comes along and says something different from what they've already implemented. That's not especially helpful um, and, and really ends up, you end up with competing um, structures and statements that kind of maybe official profile and then what is actually implemented. Um, you know, sometimes the data available or required doesn't fit the profile. I was talking to Jesse about this um, at, at the beginning. Uh, if you've got a particular application that generates certain bits of data and that data is actually what the organization needs, that's what they want to report on, but the profile says you need there's, there's some other bit of data, um, well, it, it's quite hard to say, well, we're going to spend a lot of money and time implementing the profile, even though you as a business don't actually need that data in the first place. Um, and, and actually, sometimes it can be quicker and easier to get a connection stood up with the data that is already being generated. Uh, and we've, we've seen that with a few products that are already generating some tracking data, you know, not in XAPI, but just kind of generally with their internal tracking. And so a quick way for them to implement XAPI is to translate that data to XAPI statements, which isn't necessarily the same data as a profile. Um, I guess another reason is we haven't really yet seen any big problems caused by people not implementing profiles. So most of the data in Watershed doesn't follow a profile. It hasn't really caused many problems for our clients. They're still able to use the data. Now, it may be that in future, when some of our clients start to move to other products that are maybe tracking the same data, uh, if there are differences in the data, that might cause some problems. Uh, and so I think you know, it's, it's on us to make them aware of that and try and encourage them to use profiles. But at the moment, there isn't that pain point to, to kind of encourage people. Um, 
and you know generally all have async and use the X API implementation in the existing product, which might not implement a profile. They're just going to use what whatever the product does out of the box a lot of the times. I think. Does that kind of help to answer that? Any, any sort of follow up? Yeah, questions? yeah, that does. Yeah, um, but before the last two questions, um, I just want to check in with Jesse because um, we're we're getting kind of close to the hour here. Um, sh should we move into the next two, or do you want to do, you know, housekeeping stuff, or whatever else is on the agenda? No, no, I'll just finish your interview. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so last two questions, um, are there any helpful tools, um, that you use regularly in, in your implementations? Yeah. Other so than obviously watershed. Yeah. There's a couple of classes of product that other than the kind of data sources that organizations might already have, um, there's, there's maybe two different types of thing that we might include in the, in the project. Um, on one side, it's products that maybe specialize in generating X API data. Um, so I mentioned Zappy apps already, but they have a lot of tools within Zappy apps that are good at collecting data about real world learning. Um, whether that's classroom sessions, attending classroom sessions, uh, checklists for, you know, observing someone doing a task, um, observations, um, and there's, there's another one that I'm forgetting. But they, they've got lots of tools in there. Or maybe we might partner with a consultant. So we're doing a product at the moment with Torrance Learning, um, where they are developing stuff that sends X API data um, to Watershed. Um, so that's, that's one side, we're generating the data. But then there's also consuming the data afterwards. And some of our clients will have existing BI tools that they're already paying for in the organization. And so they'll connect those BI tools to Watershed. Um, and use Watershed to aggregate the data, use Watershed for the dashboards. But if they want to do any kind of more in-depth crunching of the data, they might put that data in a BI tool to, to do some of that as well. Mm -hmm. And lastly, what's the uh, typical process that you go through um, just, you know, um, really high level, of course? Yeah, this is something we blog about a lot on our website. So I'll just mention if, if you go on the Watershed website, and uh, look for our learning analytics series. We've got this five step model and there's huge amounts of detail and resources and stuff around that. Um, but the, the high level there, the, the five steps are, the first one is plan and gather. So it's about figuring out what you're gonna do. It's about getting the data all together in one place, setting up the integrations. Um, once you've got the data together, a really important step is to spend time reviewing and kind of cleaning the data. A lot of the times, you know, the first time you've got the data connected, particularly if you're doing custom integrations rather than using existing X API implementations, you will find there are problems with the data. There might be missing data. There might be inaccurate data. So it's important to spend time looking at that data and, and, and kind of sorting it out. The third step we call operationalize. So this is about actually producing the reports and dashboards and actually you know, setting up your data so you can use it and you can get people looking at it and that sort of thing. Um, the next step, explore and analyze. So this is about digging into the data and actually asking questions of your data and looking into things. So you might notice that um, you know, it looks like lots of people are failing to turn up for training on Thursdays. Well, why is that? What is it about Thursdays? Uh, and, and so looking at Thursdays in more detail and um, you know, digging into the data in that way. Um, our fifth step we call build and refine because it's about using the data to actually make changes and then collecting more data about the effect of those changes and hopefully seeing improvements. So it's really iterating the whole process to, to get more data and to, to go in, in more detail. Um, and then another kind of call it our bonus step. It's not really a step, but something that you should be doing throughout the process is show off the data. So actually, um, you know, showing other people the data, making sure you're letting people know about what data is available, um, getting lots of people logged on to Watershed and making use of it, because uh, that's, that's the way to get interest in the business around the data and, and getting the data um, used and, and useful. Great. Um, wow, a lot of information. Um, really, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, so are there any questions from anyone who's on the line.
Yeah, I'm trying to find the page that Andrew is talking about, the learning analytics page. That yeah, if you go under resources, um, resources, and so. then I guess maybe e-guides might be the best one. We've got, I mean, you could probably click on any of these links and, and find something about our five steps. Um, so the first two there are just kind of technical XAPI guys. Mm -hmm. If you scroll down, you should see one around the five steps, hopefully. Um, you might have to keep scrolling. It might be on the next page, actually. Um, oh. Yeah, we've got lots of, lots of resources. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, here we are. There's five steps to get started with learning analytics. That the e guide is just a poster, um, so you can download, you can print it out, stick it on your wall if you want to. Um, but also within the resources section, there's e books, and the e book gives much more information. So it's that that five steps to get started with learning analytics. So it's a poster. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, well, thanks so much, Andrew. Um, uh, this has uh, been quite a session, uh, lots and lots of good info. Uh, <clears throat> Jesse, do, do you want to um, finish, finish the meeting off with housekeeping or whatever? Um, <coughs> anyone has a question? A question for Andrew? I know we have six minutes left for our SIG meeting. Um, I'm curious, I have a question. Why do um, enterprises need interoperability? Do they need to interoperable with other enterprise in terms of data format and model? Yeah, great question. So I, I don't think it's, it's so much to do with uh, interoperability with other enterprises, although that probably could be helpful in some scenarios, you know, the, the event of a merger or something like that. Um, but really, it's more about being able to integrate all of the products that they use quickly and easily. Um, so we do lots of implementation projects with lots of different customers. And in almost every single project, there are some products that already have a native X API implementation. And then there are other products that don't. And the ones that do have a native X API implementation, we can normally get integrated within a few days of kicking off the project, sometimes within a few hours of kicking off the project, or even before the project kicks off, they've already integrated with a free account. Um, whereas the applications that don't support X API, it can take a lot longer. Um, you know, it's going to take at least a month, and sometimes it, it really does take a while. Um, so that's the big advantage of having that interoperability. It's that you can connect these systems very quickly, very easily, and you know, get on with starting using the data. Mm -hmm. uh, but you mentioned that it's difficult to use uh, profiles. So the, the data from different sources are with different um, design. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so the that's right. Um, and actually, we found that that's not a massive problem. So as long as, you know, often the data from different sources is about different things. And when it's not about different things, even if they're not following a profile, they'll generally follow the same pattern anyway, to a certain extent. Um, and so, the, you know, the data is often close enough that you can use it together. Um, and we have you know, a whole bunch of flexibility built into Watershed where there are differences in the data that you can kind of, um, you can configure Watershed so that, that those differences don't matter so much. So that means um, if I have two data set from two sources that you have the tool to combine these two data set, two SAP data set, um, they, have, they, they are uh, using different profiles. Well, a lot of the time, they're, they're not necessarily following any profile at all. Mm -hmm. But they probably, if they're talking about the same things, a lot of the time they do still use similar mm -hmm. verbs or the you know, same verbs and um, activity types. Uh, so, you know, to give you an example, Visa, um, Visa case studies, 
I think a lot of people have seen that one. Um, but they actually swapped the LMS. They had one LMS, they pulled it out, they replaced it with another LMS, and they made sure the XAPI data that they were getting from both LMSs did follow broadly the same structure. And as a result of that, all the reporting, you can actually follow the kind of usage data and, and all of that stuff um, across from one LMS to another LMS seamlessly. You can have you know, one line chart that shows completions um, for both LMSs side by side and, and the data looks the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they can flow from one LRS to another LRS easily. That's right, but they didn't follow a profile. There isn't a mm -hmm. profile for LMSs and completions, but they'll all use the ADL completed verb. Um, and really, that, that's all you need for uh, kind of standardization or, you know, com compatibility. Um, so having, having a profile, I, you know, I'm definitely a big fan of profiles. I think profiles are a really good idea. Um, I'm just saying in practice, sometimes it's not too much of a problem if they don't exist yet. Uh -huh. So have you figured out an easier way to implement profile? No, I think, I think that's a challenge that we need to figure out as an industry um, is, is how do we come up with a broad set of profiles uh, quickly and in, in a way that people can actually use them. Uh, I don't think we've got a good solution to that and I'm, I'm not sure I have a good solution either, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I saw a question on the chat box from Derek. Um, what do you think? Yeah, so it's saying um, you know, if you don't follow profiles, you're not really differentiating XAPI from the general actions messaging pattern. I'm not familiar with the actions messaging pattern, so I might be misunderstanding. Um, but, I, you know, we see a real advantage of XAPI in having that standard data structure, even if the content of the statements is different. And then it really does help with building the integrations and building the reports. Mm 